Hi, I'm Kat Powers, and I am here with Victoria Helberg, the CEO of Respond. You, you were the new CEO. You're not new to Somerville. You're not even new to Respond. Right. I have been with Respond all 16 years. I've been the CEO for the past two months. Now, if I understand correctly, you're not new to Somerville either. Um, you, uh, you actually have a weirdly long history with Respond. I do. Um, so I just found out a few days ago from a former Respond volunteer who goes back to like the 1970s that Respond used to share an office building with Cass. And my mother was the executive director of Cass Head Start way back in the day. And so I was running the halls of Respond and CAS, not knowing that one day I would grow up to lead the organization. Service and leadership appears to come in your family. Absolutely. But um, this is a different mission. So domestic, what exactly is domestic violence? Well, domestic violence is um, about power and control. Domestic violence is a pattern of behavior, a pattern that um, one person uses to gain power and control over another in an intimate relationship. So what does that, it, it, are there particular, there are different kinds of relationships. Yes. Are there different kinds of abuse? Absolutely, yes. There are many different types of abuse. I think obviously the one that, um, you know, when we say domestic violence, people go to immediately is the physical abuse. Mm -hmm. But there are so many other different types of abuse. There's emotional abuse. There is um, financial abuse. There is cultural abuse. Um, you know, we, we see um, a lot of the cultural abuse in our community um, with people being isolated from their communities, with um, people being threatened with immigration. Um, financial abuse comes in many different forms, but we have a lot of clients who have absolutely zero access to funds, um, you know, aren't able to, um, keep their own paycheck, you know, really so many different types of abuse. Do they look differently? Um, you know, if, if, you know, where, if I have a colleague who shows up with a black eye, mm -hmm. I might be suspecting of his, her, their partner is, um, is, is hitting them. Mm -hmm. um, what would financial abuse look like? Well, I think that would be harder for somebody on the outside to see, right? Mm -hmm. But I think it, financial abuse would, um, you know, maybe somebody is always borrowing money because they have a, they don't have access to their own. Um, you know, if we're when we're working with people, it's the, you know, they have no access to the checking account. They've never had a checking account. You know, we worked with a client once who was so excited to go into the grocery store with a gift card because she had never had the ability to purchase her own groceries, to make her own choices. Um, but, you know, think about financial abuse and the impact that it has on survivors in terms of being able to leave a domestic violence relationship. You know, when you have absolutely nothing, where do you go? You know, what, wh how do you leave when you have no money, no access to money? We will, we will get to a little bit about how Respond jumps in and helps with that. Yes. What um, uh, the obvious domestic abuse is being hit, mm -hmm. uh, what does that look like to the rest of us? Well, I think, you know, the vis visible bruises, you know, are recognizable. But I think it's often, you know, domestic violence often... Um, isn't talked about because there is so much guilt and shame that survivors feel. And so you may not, you know, you may not see the bruises because they're hidden, but you may, you know, somebody may all of a sudden um, stop going out with friends, stop going to work events, or if they're at a work event, their partner is calling them constantly or texting them, you know, demanding to know who they're with. Um, you know, they don't do things that they enjoy anymore. Or, you know, they're, they're only wearing one type of clothing because that's all their partner will let them wear. So it, it's like looking for signs that, um, you know, may not be noticeable. What does cultural abuse look like? I think that there can be so many different forms of cultural abuse. I think one of the things that we see most frequently is the threatening somebody's immigration status, mm -hmm. threatening to call ICE, threatening to call, ch to take uh, children away, 
you know, to the, from the parent who has no immigration status, um, taking people's documents away from them, not allowing people to work, and then isolating them from their community. I think in a lot of communities, domestic violence um, isn't talked about, but it's not only is it not talked about it, but it's not, it's not real because you're, if your husband is going to hit you, then that's his right to hit you. And so oftentimes when a client tries to leave you know, their relationship, the community sometimes will you know, separate from them or the community will side with an abuser. Not always, mm -hmm. but that can happen. And you know, it's such a huge loss to the person who is trying to, to leave. Are there, well, why doesn't somebody just leave? Well, that is a good question, and I hear that so often. I think, you know, I've been, like I said, I've been doing this for a really long time, and I, people will say, well, if it was that bad, they would just leave. But that is so untrue. There are so many reasons people stay. I think one is finances, mm -hmm. children, love, hope that things will change. And then also, um, there's no resources, there's nowhere to go, but also extreme fear. When leaving is the most dangerous time for a survivor, it is during those first six months to one year that people are most likely to be killed by their intimate partner. So the six months after they leave, before they leave, what is the... Leaving is the most dangerous leaving time. Leaving is dangerous. Yep. So you think about somebody, think about a domestic violence relationship and somebody has all this power and control over this person and then they leave and that power is gone and they have no control. And so they escalate very quickly. And so they're most likely stalking that person. They're trying to track them down, you know, and that's often when they kill their partner. And the threat is there. You know, people don't leave because they're threatening. They're being told, if you leave, I'm going to kill you. Or going back to the cultural abuse, they'll threaten their families in their country. You know, I'm, I'm going to have somebody go after your family. I'll have somebody kill your family. And that is real threats. Wow. So people stay to protect their loved ones sometimes. These relationships are... Uh, don't always appear abusive to the people in them. Mm -hmm. What are signs that you are in an abusive relationship? Well, I think it's different for everybody, but I think some of the signs that we talk a lot about with our clients is somebody who is excessively jealous or somebody who might be violently jealous, somebody who tries to control what you wear, where you go, what you do, um, somebody who um, is um, putting you down, insulting you. Um, you know, I have two young children, well, two, they were young, now they're older children. Um, and one of the things that, you know, we would always look out for, or I would always say to her, if, you, if your partner is putting you down in front of your friends, that's a red flag, mm. you know. Um, but really, it is, it is some of those, red, you know, just recognizing those red flags. Um, you know, and the controlling piece, that's, that's how um, abusive people start to isolate their partner. They start by controlling where they can go, who they can see, what they can do. So that it's more work almost for the survivor to be with friends because their partner is constantly texting them. So it's that isolating them little bit by little bit mm -hmm. until they're, you know, just dependent upon them. So... Uh these are uh, folks who feel trapped, mm -hmm. isolated. Yep. Um, they, if they are at the point where they are um, ready to leave, mm -hmm. is that the, the way to put it? Yep. Um, how does, what does Respond do? So Respond has a, um, provides a large range of services. And I think it's important for the community to know that all of Respond services are free and confidential. Um, and we are providing counseling, case management, you know, and that case management can look different for everybody. For some, it may be, you know, um, that working on a safety plan so that they can escape. Um, we're doing uh, a lot of work on our support line, providing safety planning, crisis intervention, a lot of resources and referrals to our community partners. 
we provide court accompaniment. We assist people with applying for restraining orders, um, you know, help people navigate the legal system. Um, we have our SAFER program over at the Suffolk County House of Correction where we're providing incarcerated survivors with domestic violence um, support and education and post-release follow-up services. Um, and we also have our emergency shelter program, which provides uh, confidential shelter for people who are fleeing immediate danger. Um, in our shelter, we can house up to 21 individuals. Um, and then we have our housing program, which is um, one of our newest programs. So let me let me drill down on just a, a couple of the. You, you, yes. There is a laundry list of what Respond does, yep. and it's not just answering the phone when somebody says, I need to know how to leave. Right. Um, so, uh, shelter. Yes. You are sheltering, uh, you say it, it's up to 21 individuals, so yep. I shall presume this is a woman and her children? So our shelter is um, fully inclusive. We were one of the first shelters in Massachusetts to accept all genders, and, um, and that was probably back in like 2008. And so if uh, a man is fleeing his partner with yep. their daughter, yep. um, uh, you can offer immediate services, a, a place for them to be that night? I would like to say that we could offer immediate shelter. However, our shelter, along with the majority of shelters in Massachusetts, are full for almost all of the time. Wow. Um, so, but we do, we do house families, we house individuals. Um, you know, one of the really great things that I've appreciated about Respond is that we've adapted to the more modern family. So we've had a mom and a grandma. We've had uh, kids that were in college coming to stay with their parent, you know, just during school break. Um, but the shelter system is is over overcrowded, overloaded, um, and there's not enough shelter for people who are fleeing. Wow. Mm -hmm. Other services you provide. Now, incarcerated survivors. Mm -hmm. Um, I mean, I can come up with a million tabloid versions of what that looks like. What does that typically look like? Well, so we're for your folks. A couple of different. We're working with a lot of women who are sometimes labeled as perpetrators because they finally fought back. Mm -hmm. You know, um, or they're incarcerated because their abuser forced them to sell drugs, or they're. Um, abuser trafficked them. You know, most of our, the clients that we're working with are incarcerated for, um, I would say, reasons they could not control sometimes. Um, and so we are providing that domestic violence education, um, but also the support when people get out so that they can stay connected to services and they can hopefully live safer lives. And not return to an abuser. And not return to an abuser. Now that they have a record and other other issues that are that happen post incarceration. Yes, I think you know we could spend a, all of our time talking about the safer program and how um, you know in the so many you know the roadblocks that the clients coming out of the Suffolk County Correction are facing. Um, you know, we're just hoping that we can help alleviate a few of those roadblocks for them. Um, but it is a long, challenging road when you have a quarry and you can't get a job and you can't get housing. It's hard to make safe choices when there aren't a lot of choices. So one of the, uh, you offer housing. Mm -hmm. What does rapid rehousing look like? So I'm glad you asked because rapid rehousing is one of our newest programs. Um, one silver lining of COVID was that we were able to, um, we did receive a lot of housing funding. And so our rapid rehousing program allows survivors to skip that shelter step, which is great because there isn't obviously, you know, enough shelter available. And they're able to go into a new apartment um, and we're able to provide rental assistance for up to 18 months. So, and that's on a sliding scale. So for some people we're paying 30%, for some 75, for some 100. And during that time, they're working with respond housing specialists on um, on their self-identified goals. Obviously, financial stability is one of them. Um, but, you know, people are going, people are, when we're paying rent for folks, they're able to go to job training programs. They're able to work more hours. They're able to further their education. Um, 
you know, we had one of our first rapid re housing clients was able to get her bachelor's degree and she got a better job. And so after she graduated from the rapid rehousing program, she was able to take on her own lease. Um, so it has been, the funding has been, um, you know, just amazing to be able to provide people with that type of stability. Um, because it really, it does give people the opportunity to leave safely and then to not have to worry about paying their rent, but focusing on some of those other things that lead to long-term stability. When uh, you have folks who are going into housing, so if I am leaving a, uh, a situation in Somerville, my kid goes to the Healy School, mm -hmm. um, and I, I enter into your housing program mm -hmm. um, with the, the supports that come with a, a counseling and, 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 and whatnot, mm -hmm. does that mean I have to leave Somerville and my kid has to leave the Healy School? No. I think rapid rehousing has allowed people to stay in their communities. And, you know, everything is based on safety. Um, you know, so for some people, it may not be safe to stay in Somerville, no matter what. It's just not a safe option. But for some people, you know, maybe their abuser is incarcerated or maybe their abuser is, is you know, further away or, or out of state. And those people really can stay in their community. Um, but we, and we want people to stay in their communities, right? Like I think we want people to stay connected to their providers. We want people to be able to stay employed, kids to stay in school. And um, the Rapid Rehousing Program has allowed us to do that. You know, Somerville is, uh, you know, as we all know, a, you know, an amazingly diverse, family-friendly town, with great schools. Um, and so we've been able to, you know, keep people in Somerville, but also help people to relocate to Somerville. Um, you know, and it's just being in the metro Boston area makes, is, is, makes life so much easier for people, you know, to get to work, to get on the T. You know, so your footprint is not just Somerville where you're working. Mm -hmm. What if if uh, if someone is leaving a situation in Somerville, where would they where could they resettle? Yeah, anywhere in Massachusetts, really. Um, you know, Respond's been in Somerville since 1974, but we have recently. Well, not recently. We've we've grown spread out into the, you know, into the community. So we're working in Malden, we're working in Melrose, we're working in Wakefield, in Everett, in um, Wilmington, in Woburn, in Reading, in North Reading, we're really all over. Um, you know, but I do think that for working families, staying in the greater Boston area is what people need. Um, and so, you know, sometimes shelter is going to be further down in the state and that's not convenient you know you can't you people want to stay in their jobs People want to stay in their communities um so i think the majority of people are settling you know in the greater boston area but there are times when people are in extremely dangerous situations that they do have to move far far away out of state how do you find all right, so we've got we've got a huge housing problem here in Somerville, right? I mean, we we cannot build enough affordable housing mm -hmm. for those who wish to remain in Somerville. Right. Does that factor in to some of the choices that you're making when you're talking about finding um, finding a place to rapidly rehouse um, one of your can I call them clients? Is that the appropriate word? Yep. Okay. So if you're rehousing a client mm -hmm. uh, and he, she, they wish to remain in Somerville, yep. can you afford to have people living in Somerville? Well, we can afford it because mm -hmm. of the funding. Um, you know, I think um, we definitely have had a challenge getting Somerville landlords to work with us, not just Somerville, but surrounding town landlords to work with us. And um, our rapid rehousing program is really a great opportunity for everybody because we're guaranteeing rent for a landlord, which, you know, a lot of people are having a hard time paying their rent. So we're guaranteeing rent for a landlord for X amount of months. Um, and our clients are receiving those wraparound services to really help them be stable. Um, so, you know, it really is... Um, 
you know, it really is a benefit to, to both parties. To the client has a safe place to live. The landlord gets guaranteed rent. Um, and the landlord can get market rate rent? Yes, or it is it's market not... rate rent. Wow. Yes, it is market rate rent. Um, and I do believe the payments are in line with, you know, the average rent in Somerville or the surrounding communities. Mm -hmm. um, however, it does make it hard for people to stay in Somerville after they have, you know, graduated from the rapid rehousing program mm -hmm. um, because those market rate rents are so, they're not affordable for many people, you know, for two income families, right? So I think it is, we're hoping, we're during that time, they're applying for the housing vouchers, they're apply, applying for local housing authority options, lotteries, anything that has, um, you know, might be longer ter term affordability to it. How does a landlord get involved in this kind of program? Well, they could call uh, call us over at Respond. Our phone number is 617-623-5900. You could ask to speak with Rachel. She uh, is the Director of Programs and Services. Um, and we would, you know, we're definitely looking for more partners um, all the time. So we've got a, a, this is a problem that, is there a particular um, Income, race, gender, uh, is there is there a, a way to quantify who can be a victim of domestic violence? Anybody can be a victim of domestic violence. I think domestic violence definitely doesn't discriminate. It affects everyone regardless of race, ethnicity, religion, sexual orientation. It, you know, it definitely does happen in the marginalized communities much more frequently. And, you know, there's so many reasons for that. Uh, going back to, you know, um, the lack of resources, lack of financial opportunities, uh, you know, economic stability, um, you know, so it definitely is more prevalent in, in um, marginalized communities, but it affects everybody. And it's starting in middle school. So children, uh, you know, adolescents, you know, teen girls are experiencing domestic violence, you know. Um, I think about it's one in three teen girls experiences some form of domestic violence. What does it look like for a teen girl? I think it can be really difficult to recognize teen dating violence because I think teenagers are, sometimes are so uh, intense when they when they fall in love or when they start dating, right? So it has you know any some anything that may not seem healthy to us, if it's mutually agreeable, can sometimes be okay, right? But it's all about what's mutually agreeable. You know, because we may say excessive texting is a warning sign. But if both parties are into the ex excessive texting, then that's okay. But if one party is uncomfortable with it, that's a warning sign. Mm -hmm. You know, I think when you're setting boundaries that people don't respect, that's a warning sign. Um, but teen dating abuse carries a lot of the same warm, warning signs, that extreme jealousy, that keeping tabs, that controlling what you wear, what you do, who you see. Um, so looks the same a lot of times. I think the teens are definitely dealing with the tech abuse. Tech abuse. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, you'll and I'm, tech, tech is everywhere. It's like almost like it's a, a, a friend and an enemy at the same time, right? Because you can control people with tech so much nowadays. Um, you know, like tech people wanting your passwords to your social media. And, you, you know, you may hear a teenager say, well, if, you know, I, if you love me, you'll give me all your passwords. You know. Wow. I wouldn't even give my kids my own password. Exactly. You know, but for I think it's it's hard, you know, because it is like, well, maybe that's reasonable request. I think mm. kids are trying to figure these things out. What is a reason, you know, like is that is that a re reasonable that somebody says if I love them, I'm going to give them my passwords or if I love them, I'm going to, you know, only hang out with them. Mm -hmm. Um or if you love me, you're going to send photos that I can spread around school. Absolutely. Yes. So. Unfortunately, we see that a lot. Yeah. Um, kids sending, you know, photos. And, you know, it, it's that trust. They have this trust and, you know, this faith in that person. And so they think it's okay, you know. And then they, you know, unfortunately find out that it, that person, you know, did, shared them. And mm -hmm. So we just have a moment left. The... Um, you're you're dealing with some really really dark stuff. Mm -hmm. I have to presume 
the folks that respond are just all superheroes. Um, what keeps you functioning in this kind of work? You've been there 16 years. Mm -hmm. How do you actually get up and go to work every day? Well, I think there are so many reasons. Um, and today we were, um, it's the holidays, and the holidays that respond is one of my favorite times because all of the Christmas gifts are, and holiday gifts are coming in. And so our room is piling up with toys, and kids are my, you know, just my heart. Um, and so I do the work for, you know, our families coming into shelter that, you know, have, are just finding safety for the first time, you know. Um, for somebody who found their voice to give a victim impact statement at court. I really do it for the clients, and there are so many of them that have just left such an amazing, you know, they just have a piece of my heart always. So if uh, a member of the public is watching and wants to figure out how to support the work that you're doing, how do they do that? Yes, thank you for bringing that up. Um, all of response programs are supported by our generous donors. So I would say go to our website, which is www.respondinc.org, and uh, I would encourage you to donate. Also, if you're a landlord and you're willing to work with us, please call. And most important, if you're a survivor or you know a survivor um, who may be in need of services, please call our support line. It is in operation Monday through Friday from 9 to 5, and that phone number is 617-623-5900. Thank you. Uh, I'm Kat Powers. We're in, here in the beautiful SCAT building in Union Square. I've been talking with Victoria Helberg. Thank you so much. Thank you.